It's worth taking a step back and thinking about the implication of the development of these Middle Paleolithic stone tools that we're talking about. What we see in the Middle Paleolithic is the beginnings of stylistic boundaries between local and regional populations. Populations making the same basic types of tools, but with slight differences in how they're made, indicative perhaps of the makers themselves. This is clearly some indication of the cultural development within these groups, or at least a product of that cultural development. And it's worth thinking a little bit more critically about what's happening with cultural development in the Middle Paleolithic. What are the implications for how we think about evolution in Middle Paleolithic populations? One of the things we see in these populations is increasing variability in terms of what populations are doing, how they're extracting resources out of their environment, potentially how they're behaving, what kind of tools they're making, and how exactly they're making these tools. So we have variation, in other words, in terms of the cultural practices of these populations. Now, we also presumably have some mechanism for the transmission of that variation from one generation to the next. We see these stylistic boundaries persist across many generations throughout archaeological sequences. And we know from chimpanzees and primate studies that they're already pretty good learners, even if they learn passively through imitation and other kinds of basic uh, mechanisms for learning and transmitting cultural behaviors. By the time we reach the Middle Paleolithic, we see lots of evidence potentially for increased cultural transmission mechanisms. We have extended childhood, a time period rich for active learning. We have expanded brain size, again indicative perhaps of more active teaching mechanisms. In other words, a more faithful mechanism for transmitting that cultural variation from one generation to the next. So what we have is cultural variation and a more faithful replicator of that variation, transmitting it from one generation to the next. In other words, we've replicated the basic properties of DNA. We've replicated the basic properties of genetic inheritance. And therefore, that cultural variation suddenly becomes much more amenable to evolutionary forces and evolutionary change. Natural selecting, selecting different behaviors between populations. Genetic drift, leading to random differences in terms of the kind of cultural behaviors we see. Even the practices such as gene flow or mutation in terms of the development of new innovations, new cultural innovations become potentially relevant. So we could begin thinking of this as the emergence of biocultural evolution, the integration between the cultural capabilities, all those things that are beginning to shape not only the behavioral plasticity of these populations, but the environment in which they live in and how they live within that environment, and the normal biological mechanisms of evolution that we usually think about. So the emergence of biocultural evolution as an important mechanism or lens for understanding human evolutionary processes becomes critically important by the time we reach the Middle Paleolithic.